Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda Cities ABC series. Um, in our YouTube podcast series, we've been talking, interviewing, and uh, leading with the global inspiring personalities, authors, CEOs, and founders of organizations, projects, and as well creative dimensions that are changing our world and creating better narratives for everything going on. We highlight a lot of new projects and we try to specifically focus on personalities. And I love every interview because there's always new things, new people to interview, but as well people that have their own histories, their own multiple different uh, fac fac facets, let's put it that way, but as well personalities. Um, so this is part of our citiesabc.com platform. That is a, a new wiki for AR platform for cities and citizens that has been growing quite significant. And the series are distributed in the openbusinesscouncil.org. That is our other platform, intelligenthq.com. And of course, in all the multiple international mainstream podcast series like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and so forth. So we are uh, today with someone that I know for some time that I have a lot of respect because of its different uh, personality parts, but as well someone that has been very dynamic as an ambassador in the blockchain. So we're talking about Grant Blaisdell that has been creating models and ventures at the intersection of technology, media, and branding. This is actually 10 years working and living in Silicon Valley, but as well with a, a global background and uh, Los Angeles, and more recently in, the, of course, the areas of Europe and so forth. Grant is an early innovator and been applying especially the areas of blockchain and crypto to multiple industries and companies that has been created. As an entrepreneur, is is famous as being the co-founder of the leading blockchain analytics and AML company, CoinFirm, that has been creating some of the solutions, direct tech, especially for the blockchain emerging world and the, the ICOs and all these different areas. And as well now as the creator of a new or co-founder of a new venture that is the space industry Copernic space, which is quite interesting as well. He is as well a lifelong musician and hip hop artist known as uh, GB Savant and um, he's been applying technology to his music and upcoming projects such as Mr. Crypto, that is the one coming. And he's been working multiple projects and research on art, culture, music, and blockchain. And as well, he's been an ambassador. And as I mentioned as well, someone that has been creating a lot of thought leadership around these areas, which we need a lot. And as well, just as a final note, as introduction, of course, he's as well someone very, uh, with a huge amount of knowledge in the cryptocurrency world, which right now is mainstream, but when it started was not mainstream, but as well as been making a lot of different bridges between the regulatory part, the business part, the investment side, and all the decentralized discussions and philosophies around the crypto and blockchain and the technology. So welcome to our podcast, Grant. Pleasure to have you thank, here. Thanks for having me and thank you for that intro. You made me feel special. So I want to start, uh, I know that you have a, a multicultural background and I always like to emphasize that. I think especially if I see a lot of people doing great things, they have always like different backgrounds that come from different cultures, different uh, even languages and, and a lot of religions and so forth. So can you tell us about your background? That I know that you start on your teens being entrepreneur, a bit of that history of yours. Yeah, and I, I think with that, you know, I think kind of my parents' history also fits in a little bit. So um, first off, thanks for having me. And it's as good to see you as always. Um, my mother is from Warsaw originally. I'm sitting in Warsaw right now, actually Warsaw, Poland. So, you know, the communists didn't let you just leave. So my mom, as, as a young student, got a scholarship to Eastern Washington University uh, and had to escape. So she escaped south, took a boat, ended up in D.C., Back then, you know, also access to information wasn't great. So she figured that uh, her university was in the D Washington, D.C. area, ended up it was in the Washington state area. So $5 in her pocket, she somehow made it a school, eventually became one of the first kind of leading female salespeople in Silicon Valley, uh, kind of 70s, early 80s, when that was really booming. Um, and at the same time, uh, in the late 80s, she met my father, who's over 100 years that side of the family's in Detroit. So it gives you kind of another, let's say, tough side of, of the family. Um, he started off, you know, in the car industry and eventually became, you know, a computer sales guy. 
uh, eventually in Silicon Valley, but, you know, he started off when computers were the size of, you know, your house, right? And he's 82 years old. I'm 32. So he had me a bit late. But um, why I'm bringing all that up is because, it, you know, I was conceived in Palo Alto. Uh, but my parents gave me this kind of combination of this, you know, these kind of entrepreneurial balls mixed with, you know, uh, kind of a hard nosed um, get through the wall attitude that partially exists because they came through tough backgrounds. Right. And, and, you know, I've also from the art side, I have a big belief that, you know, like diamonds are created under incredible pressure and that, that a lot of times you see um, people that really accomplish great things do so because they were able to break through, not that anything was given to them really easily. Um, I was born in, in Laguna beach. That's just South of, of Los Angeles. Um, I moved to Poland in the 90s. So when communism fell, my mom brought Compaq and HP to Central Europe. So really, she brought the American computer industry to post-communist Europe. Um, a very patriotic kind of thing. Eventually, I moved back to the States when I was young. Right after I graduated high school in Indianapolis, I moved back to LA, which is where I'm originally from. And that's where I started my first startup. So originally, I was focused around uh, digital media and music. So mainly around building distribution and monetization models for digital media. In the beginning, I was focused on mobile video distribution. This was in 2006 and seven. iPhone wasn't out yet. What we were doing is we were creating video programming channels with integrated branding and advertising for touchscreen phones. Palm was the only phone you could really openly program on like that then. So it was running on, on Palm. Um, but that gave me my first lesson on failure and the, the lesson of being too early Right. So that was probably about five years too early, maybe um, as far as the market concept and how actually being early can be worse than being a bit late, to be honest, to, to the game as an entrepreneur. Um, after that, I did some pre-dev, uh, including for NBC Universal and Fox. That project was called Studio U, eventually turned into Hulu. Right. Um, that showed me a bunch of things, how these kind of platforms work, how what not to do, what to do, et cetera. And this is also around the same time I kind of got into blockchain a little bit. And I think everybody who really is passionate about it, not just from a speculative end with crypto assets, et cetera, they have kind of aha moments, right? So my aha moment was around, you know, when I was building this model, it's always this centralized third party trust element was extremely hard. You still see it in the music and digital media industry today. And we can get into that a little bit further. Um, but I realized that it solved a major core issue and, you know, mainly focused around trust. So, you know, the question is, is, you know, and I've asked a executive at Spotify this before I go. So how does the artist know that the data that you're providing them as far as how you monetized it and what they should get is true? And they said, and they did the corporate thing, dumped it off on a third party provider. I said, wait, 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 hold up. How does the third party provider that you provide that data to, how do they know? And they go silent, right? Because there is no real answer to that, right? So that's really what got me into blockchain tech. And around the same time, I got a kind of burnt out on the California startup ecosystem. Anybody who's been out there knows that it's, it's, you know, it's very networky. It's, it's actually very small in its reality. And it's, it's actually quite hesitant to change in a lot of ways, especially in Los Angeles, because that's media entertainment industry. And they're surprisingly behind when it comes to openness for being creative, open people. Right. Um, so back to the Polish thing, you know, I decided I'm going to make a life mission because Poland has some of the best tech minds, great analytic minds, great entrepreneurial minds, great ideas. What they lack is not just an access to proper financial resources, capital on proper terms, which is a big issue in Europe overall, but really the things that, for example, make American startups or salespeople, you know, really great, which is it's mainly an attitude and a cultural approach towards uh, other people, collaboration, sales, et cetera, right? It's very much relationship-based and how to speak about yourself as an entrepreneur. That's another thing I, maybe you've noticed, Denise, around startup entrepreneurs from different countries and something that I've seen, you know, kind of very American ones separates them is the capability to communicate your value and the company's value without getting into tech specs and, and numbers, right? Um, so we, I had a goal of, you know, bringing American type capital here and showing that you can build a globally successful startup using, you know, Polish founders, minds, etc. And um, my first 
foray into that was a joint venture with a big media company out here around a legacy title. I was going to digitize the blockchain, it make it English so it's global, et cetera. Once again, too early. That was about six years ago, right? Just now is that something that you can really look at doing. Um, but around the same time, I met what became my co-founders of CoinFirm. And CoinFirm became, you know, really the first use case, successful case of that model. Um, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a Polish citizen. All the founders are Polish born. Almost all the tech minds and everything are Polish born. Most of it sits in Warsaw. You know, we have representatives and offices around the world uh, and representatives and employees from different, you know, countries. But at the core, it's, it's very Polish. And we built that into a globally recognized brand and leader in its, you know, uh, industry segment. Um, so that's kind of like my quick thing. The music stuff, you know, fits there. It's the most consistent thing in my life, to be honest. I've been doing music since I was four. Uh, originally I was a string instrumentalist. So I was an orchestra for years as well. I played the viola. Um, but I, I got to a point where, Hey, I didn't want people to tell me what to play, let alone how to play it, which is pretty much what orchestra is. Um, but, uh, also I got, I realized that if I really want to have the impact that I want to have and communicate what I want to communicate, that sound by itself doesn't do that. So that's really how I started getting into hip hop as an artist itself is the fact that I can communicate very directly what I want. And I can, I also have no limits as far as soundscape, right? You know, the beauty of hip hop is you know, jazz, electro, whatever sound you want in there, it can be in there. So for example, you know, the new American dream project that's, that's coming out uh, that we talked about is heavily rock influenced. I put loads of, you know, played loads of guitar on there. It's trap and rock influence. The Mr. Crypto one, which we'll talk about is almost all kind of heavy Berlin house sounding with rapping over it. So um, either way, that's, that's kind of my thing in the music. And no matter what, I always try to mix in, you know, the, the tech aspect into it, because I think that's, you know, where a whole new level of value can be brought, uh, not just as an artist, but also as, as an entrepreneur or creator in that field. How do you see this kind of dynamics of, in one hand, being grown up and as well, uh, American, especially Silicon Valley and uh, LA, which are very creative and very dynamic and aggressive, uh, uh, locations and as well Poland that is very Catholic conservative and as well probably when we grow up we're still getting out of the communism and all these things so there would be a massive clash of cultures and, and a lot of different things so how did you dealt with that being as well a conservative a, a, a creative person but as well someone that deals with all these dynamics uh, it's a really good question uh, I'm approaching from two sides I actually think that in a lot of ways culturally Uh, there's very few countries who share more similarities with the United States uh, than Poland, actually. Um, if you look at it historically and, and you know, even the religious aspect, um, top three religious, what you would count as Western countries in the world are, um, are United States, Poland, and Turkey. Uh, I, I vague, and Turkey is kind of on the border, whether you want to count it in that for me. Um, there's a certain sense of, kind of this liberal conservatism that exists in both countries. Um, it's a bit different in Poland because it's European and, you know, the U.S. is different than everyone else. Just like, you know, the Second Amendment to most Europeans is like, oh, they absolutely don't understand it. Whereas to the average American, that's not even a question. That's a God-given right. So these are those things between, you know, the individualism and kind of the more collective approach that exists in Europe overall. Um, I, I tapped on a little bit when I was talking about, you know, the entrepreneur, the differences between entrepreneurs, how they talk about themselves, et cetera. I advise a lot of startups out here. And, and the biggest thing is, you know, they'll go on stage and be like, hi, I'm Yatsek. I graduated from here and here's our product. Right. And, and it's like, people are buying people as much as they're buying what they're selling. Right. So I was lucky enough, you know, my dad's a veteran sales guy to where he, Maybe I'm not as good at it as I should be because I can be rough around the edges. But, you know, little things like, hey, you know, making the other person feel good when they're around you and talking with you is going to be very conducive towards your long term business relationship. If they feel good around you, they want to be around you. Right. So these are these small kind of things. And, you know, Poland's got a complex history. But if you look at its history, it's really one of the first open kind of democratic societies. It's one of the most kind of entrepreneurial historically in Europe societies. Uh, from a science end, it's, you know, you can get into the Copernicus, you can get into, you know, loads of different ends. But 50 years of communism does have an effect. 
Um, and it's not an effect you can just eliminate in one or two generations because, you know, the parents, they still have that in their head. Um, so there's lots of things, you know, like Americans will always say yes, why, for, uh, why yes first. And then, but these are some more reasons we need to focus on, right? Here it's kind of flipped. It's like, no, nah, because da, 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 and you kind of have to push them, right? Which is not conducive to entrepreneurial stuff. Um, you know, I can go years of, in this discussion, you know, I'm extremely passionate and patriotic about both, both countries and try to recognize the similarities and, and, and differences in them. But uh, polls pound for pound, I put up against anyone when it comes to tech entrepreneurship. Um, their issue is cultural and it's main, it's self-defeating. I call it toxic humility. Um, but, but overall, trusting concept. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But, you know, overall it's a struggle, you know, I call it the Polish school of business. So you got guys who went through, you know, some sort of corporate management structure, but still got this leftover cultural thing, uh, over here. So business can be sometimes unpleasant with, with Polish people, whereas I feel like with Americans, the, you know, they're pretty straight up, but it's generally pleasant. Right. Um, there's a lot to work on, you know, and I've spent seven years here, you know, pounding away and there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but slowly but surely it's changing. And you can also see that in how investors are approaching it. Cause at the end of the day, one of the big issues is it's not just entrepreneurs. It's actually a bigger one is on the investors, their risk appetite. What made Silicon Valley and all in American investors, what they are is risk appetite, believing in this young entrepreneur and his vision and saying, Hey buddy, here's some money here's all the assistance I can provide. Now go and get that shit done. Right here. It's more, and same in London. Uh, I think this is a UK problem too here. It's, you know, numbers, what's your profit margin at the end of the year, uh, return on investment in two years. It's like you're dealing with startups and high risk investments. These are dreams and these are, you know, the percentage of success is minimal. So, um, so, uh, you know, these are all things that, that are getting better but are not at levels that I think, you know, are, are adequate. So you mentioned uh, your creation, new teens of the first uh, uh, ventures, um, especially in, uh, well, the, the ones in the music and as well the one that went to Wulu. And then of course you have CoinFirm and now you have Copernic. And in the same time, you kept your, your side um, as an artist, as a musician, and as well as a, an ambassador and as well a, as an evangelist, which is, I think, a word to describe you as well. So how did you manage all these different ventures uh, from your teens to now keeping all these kind of dynamics? Because it's, especially some of the companies you created became, um, a special coin firm became quite big, but as well, uh, a lot of these things imply a huge amount of work methodology and as well being between Poland and the U.S. is, is another different shift between cultures and different things. So how did you pick Pong in between this and as well, how do you I, come up with these ventures? I, uh, I sent, I had, I posted some, you know, uh, I was chatting with somebody on Instagram, you know, kind of a supporter of mine. And, and she has, I said, yeah, I just did a cover of a, I just recorded a cover of a butthole surfer song. And she goes, where do you find time for all this? And I said, I don't. You know, so it's, it's a really good question because, you know, I think it's kind of the, the struggle. It's one of the greatest strengths, but also the struggles of what I think are creators or artists. I, I view my personality actually as a creator, as an artist, more so than a businessman and numbers guy in that sense. Um, but that's a struggle of artists is, is, you know, to keep that focus, that pragmatism, time management, people management, And then you're getting into the tech stuff, which adds a whole different layer of complexity. It's a daily struggle, man, to be honest, to, to feel that you're on top of everything. You know, I'm one of those people where I wake up or at the end of the day, if I don't feel like I was, you know, performing at high capacity across the board, then I get down on myself. So that's another struggle, I think, of hyper ambitious people is like they're never really satisfied. So partially what you're seeing is like, you know, I see opportunities everywhere. I see problems to be fixed everywhere, right? And I want to fix them. I saw, you know, I interviewed Jordan Peterson once around blockchain. And uh, actually, I think it's the only interview ever of him around crypto and blockchain. And, and uh, one thing he said once was, you know, there's, there's certain people like, 
uh, you throw them in the middle of a forest and just give them an ax, they're just going to start chopping down trees, right? So um, it's a really good question. I think it's a struggle of, of dynamic creators and entrepreneurs is how to time manage and manage all that stuff. But what I have been able to find is a way to seamlessly, Coin Firm really is the most kind of off and segregated. Like, yes, it's blockchain tech and et cetera, but it's, it's you know, the, the Copernic space, my music stuff, and, and Tixie, which is another startup I'm a co-founder of, which we can, we'll get into later. Um, they all kind of share this core foundation and, and vision. Right. So, and in a lot of, in the instances of Copernic and Tixie, the blockchain infrastructure in its basic form is exactly the same. Right. And we're also going to take that into the, the music industry. You just got to tweak it a little bit here and there to fit, you know, particular use cases or, or industry needs. So uh, I'm doing more than it seems, but I'm also doing less than it seems. Quantform had a, um, a very big impact in the initially, um, uh, cryptocurrency blockchain world because it was one of the first companies to try to bring um, regulatory uh, dynamics and compliance dynamics to the crypto um, uh, kind of jungle world that was at the time. I know that as a creative, you, you probably have seen all the different areas, but you did a fantastic work in trying to create, uh, first of all, respect around the crypto, which right now is mainstream from Facebook to Square buying $50 million crypto um, this month for having in their cash flow or at least in their savings. And a lot of major banks and organizations right now, everyone using it. But that was a huge risk at the time. And what you did was, was not an easy task because, first of all, just making it credible, it's not a simple task, but as well, there's all the dynamics of going from the theory to the practice, uh, which was... Um, so can you tell us a bit about that dynamics and as well the creation of the platform? Um, yeah, well, the coin from story itself is, is great, you know. First office we had was down the street from where I am now. You know, uh, our CTO laid the, the cement down in the, in the office on the floor himself. You know, him and I carried these 100 kilo servers upstairs, you know, installed them. And it started with a couple guys in a, in a room that, you know, before we cleaned it up, looked like it was, you know, one of these classrooms in Chernobyl today. You know, you see those pictures of like these yellow walls and stuff like that. Um, and we came together. I, I don't have a financial regulatory background. But uh, I sat down with a few of the co-founders. We added our CTO and co-founder after me. Um, and I, I just connected the dots. You know, I was already a little bit in the crypto and blockchain for a while. And, and I was like, well, listen, if this is going to move into, you know, the traditional mass market, any sort of sense of adoption or commercial usage in any true sense, you know, the regulatory aspect is going to be the biggest hurdle. Um, and most specifically, the anti-money laundering aspect. And, you know, the rest of our team, uh, you know, for example, our CEO, Pavel, he's former global head of AML at RBS. Our other co-founder, Pavel, he, he ran, you know, anti-fraud for ArcelorMittal, was in big fours around it, gets the data thing really well. Um, our CTO we brought on later, you know, was doing mining farms when he was, you know, a teenager, you know, when crypto was really early. So it created this unique dynamic that created this complete team right? That everyone's really different, but it, it completes itself. And it was under, you know, we have a, we still have a really long-term mission that we're fulfilling, just like our Oracle came out, you know, the other day, which is it's AML compliance for DeFi. It's distributed, it's automated. They don't have to make centralized decisions, right? This is still fulfilling, you know, this long-term vision. But when we came out, we go, okay, you know, everyone's worried, ah, oh, you know, money laundering and crypto, da, da, da. Well, we're here to show you that we make it around 90 times more effective than it is in the traditional space with crypto. And we're automating it. We're turning it from, you know, a huge overhead to, you know, a, a utility pretty much type of tool that anyone from the smallest startup to the largest financial institution in the world can properly run AML for blockchain assets through, right? And another important part that we hit early on was blockchain agnosticism, right? Which we go, hey, it is going to be vitally important that any product platform solution that we provide to the market is capable of very quickly integrating different types of protocols within it so that it can move really across the whole market. So 
although we are much less well-funded than a chain analysis or an elliptic, we have exceeded them in very many fields by being innovative, thinking forward, uh, thinking, you know, I think about the end customer and not bringing in kind of old ways into this new economy. When we started, everyone thought we were crazy. It was one of the few times where I saw, you know, very conservative kind of uh, banking type of guys agree with the crypto anarchist types, which was, but for different reasons, and they're both wrong, which was AML for crypto, but crypto is all about money laundering. Wrong. AML for crypto, but crypto was made not to have, you know, any of these processes and, you know, it, it will kill crypto. Wrong. So, you know, five, six years, almost six years later, we're still here, we're thriving, you know, so we've ended up being right. But in the beginning, you know, I, you know, I got weird death type of threats, you know, from weird anonymous people through social media, et cetera. So, um, you know, we bit the bullet in a certain sense for the industry, um, but we, we were a little early, I guess, in a sense, but we, our product and what we're doing was good enough to where we lasted long enough to be valid on a serious commercial sense uh, within the industry. And, and now, you know, it's some of the people who said I was full of shit early on are now our clients, right? So um, <laughs> coin firm's a great success story, man, I, especially from the startup end. Like I said, we started with, with nothing, right? Just a couple guys in the middle of Warsaw taking on, you know, Titans funded by big VCs, right? And, and that's how we did it. It's probably the most, my most proud accomplishment of my life. And no matter what, you know, my personal relationship or professional relationship may, may be or become with, with my founders, I'll always love them like family, right? Because you can't, I've spent more time with them than my own family over the past five years. And in the last five years, um, <clears throat> actually probably more than five, but especially the last five, of course, there was a massive revolution in everything crypto and blockchain. Uh, of course, crypto became mainstream. Uh, blockchain is becoming as well the foundational technology that is changing everything in the world. So how do you see this kind of uh, the last, uh, well, uh, since this inception, the, the, the evolution of crypto and blockchain? Because I think it's particularly important to look at it right now. And I know that you have a very transversal and 360 of view uh, of, of uh, both blockchain and crypto, like very few people, because there are people that are just in blockchain and there are people that are just in crypto and very few people can actually look at the two angles and as well looking as well at the, the philosophy behind it and all the different waves that came out of it. You know, I think now is an important time because now is a time where, you know, a lot of these kind of concepts, initial ideas, plans, even some initial technology that can be applied to traditional or, you know, already functioning industries within the economy. And that's the blockchain end to me. And then you have that crypto end, which it's good to segregate. They overlap, obviously, but there's certain segregations, right? Like, I don't like, I don't like the speculative part. I understand that it drives certain things and it fits, you know, tokenomics models and it drives general consumer interests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not that I don't see the value in that. It's just, it's not something that excites me. Uh, I've never been much into speculation and stuff like that. Um, what I think we're going to see though is, well, we've already seen it since the ICO, you know, there's even dedicated projects to categorizing and eliminating dead tokens. Right. So we're going to start seeing this. I think this market constrict and it's also going to be for companies like us service providers. That's going to constrict. The utopian vision and why, you know, I clashed early on with a lot of these crypto people, some of them very influential. Of course, they never came back and apologized and said, you know what, you were right. And this AML thing, you know, the AML is a different thing. Um, but, you know, they have this utopian vision of, you know, crypto and everything and everyone's going to be doing crypto. And the point is, is that majority of these speculative assets around crypto have no function and actually have no real value. If it doesn't have utility and it doesn't have some sort of real set value, like it, to me, it doesn't have much function. So what you're going to see, I think you're going to see a lot of this constrict. You're going to have the part of the assets that are really viewed as assets. Bitcoin, of course, being the core foundation of it. And then you have ones that are in the utility sense. They're assets, 
but they're performing some sort of function. So like we did, we built the AMLT token for our AMLT network. And it also powers that AML Oracle that just came out, right? It serves some sort of function within some sort of case that's needed within the industry and normal business functions. So, you know, and, and you're starting to see, like you see things like Rari, right? So you have kind of this NFT revolution happening. Then, you know, you have this DeFi thing happening, which we're also trying to address. But what I, I get more interested into is, you know, the stuff that I was talking about with, with you know, around digital media, you know, what I'm trying to do around Copernic space, around, you know, using blockchain to provide uh, uh, security and scalability to digital marketplaces for industries that need that, like space industry, where, you know, uh, auditability and the security of these digital space assets is extremely important, right? Um, so those things interest me a lot more, you know, the reason I, I was a few minutes late to this, which I apologize once again, is because I was getting out of meeting with a guy who runs a big, who runs out here, a, a digital marketing agency focused on influencers. And so he's sitting down talking to me, listen, we're going to build an app for next year around, uh, around giving these influencers the ability to kind of like micro ICO provide their fan base, you know, these tokens that then they can interact with and exchange value with, right? And these are industry people coming, not blockchain people trying to sell into industry, which leads to another issue, which you saw a lot of these projects dying, like in the music industry, I saw loads of them, because you got music guys thinking up, you know, tokenomics models and, you know, blockchain stuff, and then trying to sell it into the music industry, without being able to properly do integrations or, or the product really, et cetera. On the flip side, you got all these blockchain guys who we're going to create a solution for the music industry and they know Jack about the music industry and don't know how to sell it into the music industry. Don't know how to deal with these people. Right? So now you have this kind of converging of these worlds. I'm kind of weird. You know, I, I kind of feel like I don't fit in very well cause I'm neither really that nor neither really that. Like I don't know how to talk to rappers really, even as a rapper. Um, but now is the time of, I think, true maturity of, of the industry and, you know, success of companies like coin firm or, or, you know, the eventual success of, of platforms like the parent space or Tixie, the ticketing one I'm doing with the concert agency. You know, I think those are going to be those, those use cases, but people need to quit looking as blockchain as something that's front facing that you even have to know that it's be, being used and being successful. That's another one of the flaws. Of, of the crypto kind of early crypto people are trying to sell in crypto or blockchain sort of products or something into these more traditional industries is they were selling blockchain. They're coming in, they go, blockchain, 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 blockchain. No, you sell the value add, you sell the product and then blockchain is supplementary, right? So I think it's, I think it's a good time actually. And very important. I know most of your, your viewers probably get blockchain pretty well based off your history, but it's still early time still an early time to get in, you know? So uh, I would never dissuade people from entering blockchain. Like it's too late. It's too mature. It's had incredible progress for 10 years. If you look at it from a 10 year span, it's incredible progress. So I want to touch once we are in the blockchain. Uh, and uh, So one of the things you, you just mentioned, the uh, reward influences, which is something that I'm working. So we have to have a talk about that. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I'm particularly interesting is all the way society can actually so at the moment we are in a massive dystopian reality where we have people like us that are completely digital and very advanced and we understand this and we live this and we brief this and then the rest of the world that kind of is addicted to this social media gambling and all these kind of things and as well even with the Cambridge Analytica and all this stuff in in very tricky situations most of people and then we have even governments that have no clue about what is going on, uh, which is most of them. Um, so how do you see this kind of specially dynamics around the, the blockchain vision of decentralization and as well of creating a reward society and as well all the work you've been doing as a creator and as well as evangelist? Because I think I know that you are as well pushing, you push Poland, you've been pushing a lot of things. And as well, you always try to create a positive way of using things with your creative uh, energy and as well activism. So how do you see this kind of special the moments we are right now in terms of blockchain and AI, but especially blockchain and, and the, all the decentralization versus centralization, which you mentioned as well? Yeah, I think, 
once again, back to the utopia of kind of early days of crypto was like decentralized everything. What did we see pretty quickly is the wealth within crypto centralized, just like it did in the traditional industry really fast. Whales, all these sort of guys, you still actually have majority of the wealth held by X amounts of individuals or um, or companies. So it comes back, like I wanted to be a psychologist when I was a kid. My dad's a psych major. Um, and it's kind of my views on, on, you know, why I don't think pure libertarianism works or anarchy or communism is because it really fights against human nature. So this whole thing of this totally decentralized aspect, it's utopian to me. Um, you know, where, for example, custodians are coming in. Are we expecting average Joe to handle private keys and custody his own crypto? I mean, we've already seen the repercussions of, of, of that sort of approach. But decentralization can exist within these applications. So just like with the Copernic Space one, you know, you're talking about entities who you know, are not digital at all. Let's move government to the side because government I'm going to leave as the last ones to catch anything, right? Um, but even like with the Copernic Space one, you got, you know, a process where this company structures satellite data and is going to sell it to this company to use or this government to use. You know, these are processes that, that have, or in the financial industry, which people understand better when you do an international bank transfer, all these processes have loads of middlemen in between them, right? Who for the most part are there for trust aspects and they all take time and money for the most part out of the transfer of value between, end, between the end, end point entities, right? So, um, and this comes back to what I was talking about, centralization, that third party central thing in all these platforms and industries and networks, like the Spotify's or whatever it may be, right? You can remove using blockchain technology, loads of the needs that are related to trust of those entities existing and removing value and time out of this chain. So taking something like, hopefully, you know, something like uh, a satellite imagery license, whereas the transaction to execute all this stuff could take weeks previously, it's something now to where you could accomplish in potentially, you know, minutes or hours using a digital platform built on blockchain, fully auditable, et cetera, right? So these are the kind of elements of, of decentralization for an artist. I ask, uh, you know, if I ask a big artist, tell me what is the benefit of you uh, when you release a new album or you release a new music video for you to put it first on Spotify, YouTube, et cetera, as opposed to on your native digital properties, building a proper incentive model to have users come and interact with you directly, not ignore Spotify, not ignore YouTube, use those platforms but create incentives for your users or your listeners in this case to interact with you directly. I mean, I do cool little, you know, goofy cases around this as, as a musician myself, when I do concerts, I'll usually do a little Bitcoin giveaway, like, you know, throw some stickers. One has a big B, then some has to do an Instagram. And I'll usually give three people a tiny bit of Bitcoin. Why? Because if you look at it in a certain place, now I have a direct relationship with my user at point of value transfer. So like if I had their bank account number, right? So it creates a whole different dynamic for creators, service providers, products, et cetera, right? Um, those are kind of ways I get into decentralization, but it's not a decentralization in the sense of, you know, everyone's autonomous and, and you know, there is no central entity that's looking over it. Like with preparing space, I have to onboard entities. I have to put them through a strict KYC and due diligence phase because the security and legitimacy of this entire marketplace relies on it. How am I going to, how am I going to distribute that decentralize that? So, you know, yes, you have certain answers just like with coin firm did with the, the AML Oracle is we're providing something that used to have to be a centralized decision and we've automated it and allowed it to be, you know, decentralized technically. But at the end of the day, it's just like DEXs were created by someone. You know, there is some central thing that created it. So it, it really gets into the definitions of words, but, but that's how I view decentralization. I don't view it in the utopian sense.
what about Copernic space? So you, you touched that a couple of times. So can you tell us what is Copernic space? I know that is a very ambitious project that touches uh, space, marketplaces, and a lot of different areas. So can you tell us about it? Sure. Yeah, uh, just quick background. My, my grandfather from my mother's side was, I guess you could call him a professor of space at the military academy here in Poland. Uh, my mother has been involved in the industry for a while. Her and I have a foundation together called the Lady Rocket Foundation, which provides space and entrepreneurship initiatives for youth, mainly disadvantaged uh, females, uh, by using entertainment and tech, etc. Um, so we've been doing lots of work kind of around the space for years. Copernic space as a concept, and even the model is about five, six years old. Once again, about being early, um, you know, but early on, I recognized that I don't think not, it was the space industry or these companies really ready for it. But I don't think blockchain, the blockchain market itself and technology were at these mature points to really build a comprehensive marketplace yet. Uh, so we kind of put it on hold and I built, you know, coin firm during that. Um, but when you look at the space industry, first off, within 15 years, it's supposed to hit three trillion dollars as as far as an industry. Uh, it's already nearing one trillion right now. Um, but most people almost exclusively focus on the physical element, you know, which is a huge part of it. Really important, you know, the the element that Elon Musk is doing, shooting rockets in space, etc. But uh, what most people don't see is downstream. So what we call digital space assets. So these, this is satellite data, satellite imagery, intellectual property, software licenses. This is billions upon billions upon billions of dollars uh, that exists that is commercialized in a very limited manner, if at all, especially in the sense of IP. And this goes all the way from big governmental in, uh, institutions like NASA. NASA is trying to figure out a way to commercialize and provide their IP, et cetera, at scale to the public, uh, all the way down to startups, right? Who are generating some sort of data, some sort of, you know, so, uh, software license, et cetera. And, uh, you know, you have this multi-billion dollar industry, but it has no marketplace. They are conducting still business on 1960s, you know, mixed with modern computers sort of processes, right? So, um, we wanted to provide a marketplace that's not just for these space entities to interact and transact with each other, right? Which is vitally important as well. But the other part of people don't get about the space industry and they forget, you know, we're using computers, cell phones. This pretty much all started off as defense or aerospace technology and research, right? So what people don't see a lot is, there's thousands of companies and entities around the world who aren't in the space industry who can use and take advantage of these digital space assets, but they have lack of having an open marketplace ease of access to it. So one of the use cases we have on the marketplace, you know, the beginning ones we're coming out with is uh, a company called Humbatech run by a guy named Marco. He's originally from Angola. And what he's been doing is he's been structuring satellite imagery and data, uh, in an actionable way and then providing it to uh, farmers, farming companies and the government in Angola to, you know, better apply to the agriculture sector. Right. I, we have another one where, you know, I'm from Southern California originally I used to live in Palisades in Malibu area. Malibu burns down every couple of years, millions upon millions of dollars and lives are, are, are homes are lost. And actually the funny thing is that, you know, they still mainly use pretty much helicopters and some drone technology to, uh, manage this, right? So another case we're doing is is with an app that's being built called Zuma is, you know, allow these apps to purchase data that they need on the marketplace. So then they can use it in, in their commercial application, which would be to, you know, save property lives in, in Malibu and other municipalities that have to deal with, with things like giant wildfires. So the point is, is that there's, there's trillions of dollars in, in IP digital, these space digital assets uh, that the world can use and the marketplace needs to be built for it. And, you know, the, the industry and they need that. They understand that the, the, the scalability, uh, commercial scalability is needed and that there's, there's way more potential clients for them out there. 
Um, so that's, you know, the main part of Copernic space. This is, uh, and you know, a non fungible token powered smart contract powered marketplace. So each entity after, you know, strict due diligence are onboarded on the platform. They start registering under their ownership, what we call these space digital assets. Um, those are turned into NFTs. Those NFTs are the actual asset that is transacted on the platform. They set the parameters that generates an, a smart contract. Uh, and if that smart contract is fulfilled, it transfers the asset and the payment along with it. Uh, but because we don't, you know, we're not here to provide this to crypto enthusiasts. This is mainly a B2B true industry play. Uh, for us, you know, fiat in, transfer to a, a uh, blockchain asset or stable coin of some kind, you know, transfer that value along the blockchain rails and then fiat out on the other end. You know, this whole era of expecting you know, mass adoption or B2B usage, uh, you know, try forcing Boeing, Boeing to buy some Ethereum and then use it on a platform. You know, these aren't logical approaches um, um, to that. So we're taking a very pragmatic approach. I brought some great people with, uh, onto the team with some industry experience, you know, who have dealt in these aspects. And the second part, which, you know, I mentioned to you before, which I think a lot of people in crypto will really like, uh, is, you know, I've, I've managed an ICO before because CoinFirm was the first to do, uh, be able to do AML for Ethereum and tokens. We did AML for loads of ICOs. Uh, these startups and even NASA have huge problems gaining financial support or getting investment even. So the second layer of Copernic that will be along with it will be these companies and entities that register and are onboarded have the capability to put themselves or their project for public financial support when the STO regulatory market clears up a little bit uh, for the companies that, that apply to this, we will transfer that to an STO model and let the larger public invest and become a part of space. Our whole thing is democratizing space, right? Is, is not making it something for a few companies and a few billionaires to play with, right? It's the, one of the most universally loved things in the world, right? It's, it's, maybe even more love than music. You ever gone up to somebody be like, you like space? And they're like, nah, I hate space. Like there's just, there's this weird emotional factor with space. You know, you see it on the street, more people wear NASA shirts now than Nike. You know, there's something there that is untapped. And I believe there's trillions of dollars in assets as well as finances willing to go to it. It's just, you have to provide the marketplace that's democratized in its sort of access. Very bold. And I, think I agree with you. There's an area that needs a lot of work. It's not my area of expertise, but I've been talking with people in the industry. And I know that, first of all, there's a lot of investment. And of course, the, from the satellites, a lot of areas is a massive area. So going right now in the final part, we are passing one hour. But one of the things I want to highlight, of course, is your creative side. So tell me about your creative side, about your different personas as an artist and, and the different areas, Mr. Crypto. Um, Savage and as well the, some of your uh, different personas. So how has been your work as an artist, as a creator and what's your goals on that as well? Yeah, I started off uh, as I said before, music's the most consistent thing in my life. I did some painting when I was younger and yesterday actually I just bought a painting. One of my favorite artists in the world brought it to me. I was speaking at a conference here with the Polish Space Agency and he did some art uh, inspired by Werner von Braun and I bought one of them. He brought them yesterday, but, but either way, uh, music has been most consistent since I was about four, originally an instrumentalist focused on orchestra and metal played the, the viola. I got kind of burnt out, uh, by that really got into hip hop because it gave me no borders as far as communication and sound. Um, I eventually, I always, I worked for about 10 years to find my individual sound and identity as a solo artist. For years I, I was in LA, I was kind of writing and producing for, for other people. Uh, and I, it took me a long time and a lot of the personal investment, both financially time wise and, and practice, if you want to call it that to, to really build my identity. Uh, and that's the, you know, the GB savant kind of alter ego, which is my initials with savant followed by that was inspired by a book called anthropologist on Mars, um, written by a psychologist called Oliver Sacks. He died not too long ago. Uh, the movie temple is, is inspired by one of the stories in it, which is about temple grand. And so it's, it's pretty much about uh, highly functioning autistic people, uh, otherwise known as, well, not all savants are autistic. There's a small percentage that are, are 
normal, let's say. Um, but most savants are artistic, but these are people who have, you know, remarkable capabilities in, in something, you know, the rain man is the, the average person's, you know, cultural connection to what a savant may be. Right. Um, so it was more there to relay, you know, uh, you know, uh, someone who's, who might not be, who might seem a little off, but in, in at least one field, they are extremely, you know, dedicated and out there to it. Um, I've always wanted to figure out how I can mix technology with music and blockchain gave me that capability as well. So, but I'm a conceptual artist and uh, which means whatever I create is under some idea or concept. So the first project I have coming out, the lead kind of the lead music video off of it, it's already released. It's called coronavirus soup for the soul. You can go on YouTube and find that. That's part of the new American dream project. So this is my kind of, I would say dystopian future, but it's a dystopian reality. We're living really now and seeing really manifest itself in the streets and corridors of politics in the United States. Most of the album I wrote four or five years ago, actually. So it was kind of prophetic in a sense. Um, and I'm trying to launch that in time for the election, right? So I'm going to release some more stuff around it. It's all very, I mean, you'll, you'll see when it comes out. So I, I mix a lot of these elements and, and as a part of it, you know, I also do, you know, fashion dedicated to it. So this is my own, you know, GB Savant jacket for the new American dream. So I have a song, for example, called Scarface Putin on it. So I had, there's a Pol Polish artist I really, really like. I really like her style and she built, you know, this for me on the jacket. So the new American dream, Scarface Putin, she's kind of mixing all these, all these things together into, you know, cohesive concepts. Um, this project is going to serve as kind of a little beta MVP test of some tokenization and blockchain registration around it. Um, but the big one for that is Mr. Crypto, which is coming next year. This is a, this is an EP project that's very electronic. It's dedicated to this dystopian technological future vision. Um, and all that's going to be tokenized, registered, and I'm going to be my own guinea pig into some of these models we discussed earlier about incentivizing uh, users to interact directly with the artists on their digital properties and provide them, you know, some sort of tokenization models that, that really push that forward. Um, so I'm, I'm now I'm working with various producers, but I kind of have my own team. You know, uh, like I said, it took me a long time to build my own sound. I think it's uniquely my sound, my identity. And uh, I need all the help I can get, actually. Of all the things I'm doing, that's the one I need the most help in. Um, for being, uh, I think, a very skilled, you know, as founding chief marketing officer of CoinFirm, I pretty much built that brand with pretty much zero marketing dollars. Uh, I have a harder time being a selfless promoter of myself than I do of, of my, you know, company. So that's, but I would never forgive myself if I didn't try this, you know? No, that's wonderful. And I think you should, uh, I think our creative side is, is fantastic. And I think there's, there's someone, um, I always forget his name, but uh, there's someone in Silicon Valley that I just want to bring to the table. And uh, he is a musician, so he's McNe uh, McNemi, I think you know him. So Roger McNemi, which is a, kind of one of the fathers of Silicon Valley. So just uh, as one of the last things, so, so I want to talk about so you, one of the things you're working and then we'll try to, to give some ideas about uh, uh, special and social media promotion of your work. So I know the questions I have for you, so is, in terms of the work you've been doing in terms of blockchain and, uh, and solutions for creators, and you touched some of these things, but I want to go a bit more detail. So, I, I, at the moment, especially with COVID, there's a massive challenge for creators and for artists and musicians to make money because they cannot uh, make concerts and and very few people can actually, uh, they, well, the, the, a lot of people are struggling from what I've been seeing. How do you suggest and as well your work on this area of uh, both blockchain and crypto solutions and rewarding artists and actually creating their own communities and tailoring services using blockchain. So can you tell us about that experience and some of the ideas that you've been studying and working on this? Yeah, I, uh, I got a buddy in New York City. Uh, God, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I'll send it to you. Um, but when all of this happened, you know, New York, New York City is a massive service economy, you know. 
really at the end of the day, whether you're a graphic artist or whatever it is. So, you know, when that happened, everybody, you know, so many people lost their income. Um, but still there are lots of people that had a really good income. Their income actually increased due to it, or, you know, they had wealth stashed away, or maybe they just had some spare change. Uh, what's it called? Reveler? I can't remember what it's called, but either way, what he did is he built kind of this open community where creators or artists, freelancers would say, Hey, I'm a freelancer. This is what I do. Here's some of my work. I need some help. And people would contribute. He didn't build it on any tokenized or blockchain model to begin with just straight like PayPal me, Venmo me, whatever it may be. But I think it served as kind of a foundation of what could happen long-term. Unfortunately, the way I see the world going, a lot of people are looking to governments to provide answers to what you just asked me, which, uh, you know, generally is the least uh, effective and efficient manner of doing so. Uh, I'm much more of a believer in potentially, uh, I don't view it as unions in any sort of sense, but I view kind of these independent communities that invest in themselves over time for these sorts of cases where there has to be a heavy control mechanism on it because, you know, it will, it would just be, you know, for a smart scammer, it could be, these sort of models could be great. Uh, but if you have really good controls, you know, creating these kind of tokenized blockchain based models and communities that self sustain and support each other. The thing is with artists and musicians and stuff like that is, is like they don't think in that manner very much generally. Uh, everyone is competition in a way generally. So uh, there's a lot of struggles around that. I think, you know, although the ICO era had obviously loads of problems and 90 something percent of those projects were crap or scams or whatever it was. Um, I think that showed though an open way, just like with the Copernic space thing, you know, one of our long-term goals, like with NASA is let the American public support NASA. I'm sure they would love to, right. But it's about building these open mechanisms and platforms for people to, you know, support each other. I want people to get away from, you know, forcing the government to take from others and redistribute it as opposed to creating proper mechanisms and tools focused around communities for people to do it individually, whether that's churches, which, you know, that was the social, you know, that was the social security system, you know, <laughs> throughout history has usually been churches and community oriented stuff. And we've gotten so outside of real community and we got into these communities of identity factors or communities of ideologies as opposed to, you know, communities of the people we live and work with, right? Um, so I, from a socioeconomic perspective, it's really hard. Um, but I view blockchain as being that trust layer, right? Just like, you know, if I showed that I provided to ETH and I got this many tokens back in the blockchain, that's provable, that's there. Right. So if we can build a system that kind of holds everybody to task is, is transparent in, in that aspect, then I think there's there's potential for it. But crypto is one of the few few industries that hasn't suffered during the COVID time. Um, and I think it's one of the few kind of industries or technologies that really can provide that once again, democratization. You know, with 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 coin firm, what we were doing, what we're doing is we're democratizing AML. We're making AML usable and accessible for the smallest guy in startup, where it used to be reserved for big companies. And it was a big way that big companies get small competition out. Doing the same thing with space, democratize access to these resources and allow these companies who have these resources to commercialize them in bigger scale and create more stuff, create more value for the economy. And this sort of same sort of sense here, create communities or platforms that, that democratizes you know, financial or charitable support for creators. Um, but creators at the end of the day need to learn how to monetize themselves better. And I'm a core example of that. There's no reason why, you know, I shouldn't be able to monetize myself just by talking to you the way I'm talking to you, right? You know how the consulting business is. You got loads of guys who don't know crap 
and really are ruining loads of things inside companies getting paid, you know, six figures to do so, right? The struggle of an artist is how to, how do I, you know, trans, how do I convince people to provide value for me, for my work, right? No, that's completely, I think that is a big, um, a big thing for the next, the future of work. And I think probably it's a good way to wrap up as well. So I think, uh, well, there's a lot of things here. I want to thank you for this time. Always uh, happy to notes. jump into it. Uh, always happy to, you know, go deeper into it another time as well. Because as, as you know, it's multi-layered and faceted. No, completely. So I think we're going to put the links to your channels and I think special for your music. I'm actually curious as well to know more, especially new projects coming. And as well, like you said, I think that I think it's a good point. And I think for a wrap up um, is that definitely the, even for people like us, they are digital. It's sometimes very difficult to monetize. And I think this is a big thing. And I think this is the probably where people like us need to unite and come up with solutions. So I'll leave that as a, a bigger push for us to work more on that area. And definitely there's a couple of solutions that I think we can actually be more active. So I don't know if there's any other final words you want to talk just about uh, where no, people I, can I, find you. I just want to, sorry, it, it was interrupting a bit, but I just wanted to first off, thank you once again um, um, for having me. Always great talking to you. And, you know, I look forward to, you know, exploring some things further. Um, you know, from my end as an artist, social media, you can find me pretty much anywhere at GB Savant, uh, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is. I kind of mix it up on there. I do little techie blockchain stuff. I do, you know, music and live performance stuff as well on there. So uh, interesting for you to look. Of course, follow also at Copernic Space on any of the digital properties, as well as at CoinFirm underscore IO. Um, you know, I, I got to be better about plugging, selflessly plugging myself and my, my stuff in. So thank you for asking me that. Um, but yeah, either way, follow me on GB Savant, uh, you know, Copernic space where we're really starting to churn, you know, content out there. Like I've been speaking at conferences all week. Uh, so thank you, uh, once again for this opportunity. And I, I look forward to seeing myself talk on, on the channel and all the wonderful comments underneath. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I hope that will be okay. Thank no, you. no worries. A lot of energy. Thank you so much. Grant. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah.